start of 2021. Uh, if you missed the preamble just a second ago, um, this is our first webinar that we've done of 2021. We usually run these events in the real world for free. Um, we've done many over the last uh, few years, some very, very big and some uh, very small and intimate. Um, but today this is open up to the world to find out more about uh, how to make marketing more effective and get better ROI from your um, efforts, which we know is very, very important. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about how we know that in a second. So um, without further ado, I'll just talk through uh, the agenda very quickly, he says. So um, I'll talk a little bit about our guest speaker and why we're running this particular event today uh, in a second. Um, we have some Q&A session at the end for about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how many questions we get. We've already had some come in, but as I mentioned, there's a Q&A box just down there. If you've got anything that you can think of right now, put it in there, but also if anything comes up during the presentation, please feel free to note it down. And we may, uh, if it's relevant or easy for Russell to stop, um, get him to just answer the question as we're going, um, or we may just park it to the end and come back to it. Um, we've also got a little bit at the end just to talk about our next event, um, because we're going to do a series of these and um, talk about a bit about what that's going to be and, and when. So very, very quickly, we're not here to sell today, but just to give you a perspective if you've never um, spoken to anyone at DDO before, don't know who we are. Uh, we are, I guess we would describe ourselves as a full service digital marketing agency. Uh, we have experts in these main areas within the business. We don't have people that do seven different things. Um, we are very um, expert at what we do. So we look at strategy for clients, uh, whether it's through to planning, whether it's looking at how do you make the right choices about channels. Uh, we cover all of the, the holistic things, but then we can deliver on both sides of the opportunity, which is either pushing people through to websites through paid search, uh, SEO, or sometimes social media and email through to then collecting information on a website, making the website look brilliant and um, operate really smoothly um, through our design and build, which could be again, building websites or apps or just making sure that they convert as well as they could do. So our opportunity today is to talk about all of those things because they do all interlink, they all play off of each other. And I guess you're probably covering all of these things in yourselves. Um, and this is your opportunity to learn about how to join the dots between website marketing and thinking about the big picture stuff. Now, we decided to run these webinars um, in the coming weeks and months based on the research that we do every year of our clients. Um, we run, uh, I guess, an NPS type survey every year to make sure that we're doing the best we can for our clients and very pleased of some of the results we've had in the last few years. So thank you, team, if you're here. But also we ask our clients what their big challenges are. Um, and this is just sort of showing the last few years of asking exactly the same questions to our audience just to see how they're, change, um, how they're changing in terms of what they perceive as important in their roles within the opportunities that they have with the, as marketeers. In 2018, making the website convert better was a very important thing, but proving ROI of activity, you know, it's on the top five, top six things that people were thinking about, but not really high on the list. Forward to 2019, again, we're still wanting to see more websites um, convert better and getting more leads through online. Um, and again, hadn't really seen much of a change, a few things just swapping around one or two. But when we ran our survey at the end of last year, um, we had a stark um, realization that actually proving the ROI of what was happening was really uh, top of the list now for people's thoughts about 2021, uh, given what's happened with COVID. Um, perhaps some fears around Brexit and just general, I think, marketing uh, pressures that happen when uh, we're spending money and doing work. So for us, we thought about how do we how do we provide value around this uh, topic? How can we find people who know what they're talking about as, as well as ourselves? Um, and this is why we're running this event today. Um, we also know that tracking stuff, improving in, um, of what activity you're doing is, is sometimes quite hard. Uh, we know that Google dominates everything. Um, whether it's you know search, whether it's um, even analytics, um, the, their goal is to make more money, not necessarily to help us. They do provide some great tracking tools, and we'll, we'll talk about those in the coming uh, moments. Uh, we also know that most people um, get a lot of their traffic from from Google and Facebook, um, but understanding how those two things interplay is sometimes very very tricky. Should I spend more on Facebook or or more on Google or, or both or less? Um, those are things we don't really always know. And we work with a lot of clients to try and piece those bits together. Um, but we still see this mentality of I spend some money and I still get some sales. But what happens in the middle, I don't really know. But with that approach, um, figuring out 
how to get better sales, how to improve my ROI is sometimes tricky because competition increases, uh, costs increase, complexity increases as well as we have more fragmented journeys. So for us, we really want to understand as how, how those things interplay and really where the best um, changes can happen for ROI to happen. So it's really about making sure you have the right data, you're tracking the right things and understand your audience as much as possible to figure out how to make um, better decisions and as I say, get better profits. Um, now, the people we have speak at our events to um, cover off the topics we know are important, uh, usually people that we've seen and um, it's very rare that we have people come um, on our screens or at our events who we don't know because um, we want to keep the bar as high as possible with quality. And I've um, seen Russell speak on a number of occasions, first time about three or four years ago and actually spoke at the same event as him. And I always had in the back of my head about when can we actually get him to us to do, an, a, do a presentation. So uh, I'm very um, honoured to present Russell McCarthy today as our guest speaker. Uh, have seen him speak before. Um, I've seen him on YouTube a few times. Uh, a fantastic presenter, um, but really, really knows his stuff when it comes to understanding the whole journey that a customer may go on and making better decisions. Um, Russell's had a career of over 10 years in this industry, um, is now um, uh, president or CEO of uh, Ringside Data, um, a company who are doing some amazing things in the analytics space. And I guess it's at this point I need to hand over to him because he's the expert and can tell you everything you're here to know. So Russell, without further ado, can you take control, please? Thanks, Andy. That's a very kind introduction. Um, uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, let me see if this is all working. It is. Uh, you can see the stark contrast between the two slide decks there. Um, I am going to shoehorn back to the future into data because everyone knows that data isn't necessarily the most interesting topic. Uh, I'm a huge nerd, so it's super interesting for me. Um, but we're going to use the context of Back to the Future to take you on a journey through the films. Um, small bit of introductions. Uh, so you can find me on all the social medias on the Rusty Bear. Um, and uh, that's mainly Twitter, but it's, you can find me on all of the other ones. And I did notice before that uh, Maddie's photo was her hugging a cat. And I realized that uh, I have a, a dislike slash hatred of cats. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I feel a little bit bad about that, but uh, we'll move on quickly. Uh, dinosaurs are obviously better than cats. So back to the future. Some of my favorite films, specifically number two, um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna put each of these films, mainly the first two, because they're the better ones, uh, into the context of data and, and explain how the premise of those films actually influences uh, a lot of the ways that we should look at data and analyze data at, as a platform. So the first one, so the quote from that film, I guess you guys aren't ready for that yet, but your kids are gonna love it. So how can we actually understand the timeline of Back to the Future? That's the first thing we need to understand. Now, this is a fantastic image. Uh, you can find a video explaining all of the timelines of these films. But what we want to do is understand a customer journey, as Andy was saying. So a customer journey is not as simple as the last thing they do before they convert with your brand or website. And that is the same for e-commerce, it is the same for lead gen, it's the same for travel. We want to have a better understanding of what that customer had perception wise when they came to the site all the way through to when they actually converted the first time and then subsequently for future purchases down the line. Um, I, I think everyone's probably just still reading this because it's a fantastic visual, but the Back to the Future one is interesting because what that does is it shows that that timeline, although similar through to a certain point, breaks off and goes down to different tranches. So what we do is we can overlay what a typical e-commerce journey would look like. And we, we use e-commerce as the example here because this is the one where as a consumer ourselves, we can easily understand what the context of a journey looks like. So in this journey, there are five visits. Um, each of those visits has slightly different channel engagements that started that visit itself. And the important bit that I want to just highlight to you is it's not just about how many visits there are in a customer journey. It's not just about the channel that drove that particular visit itself. 
one of the most important things that people don't look at are micro conversions. And they're the things that a customer is showing us that are important within that journey. So it could be things like viewing a product page, adding to basket, watching a video, reading a blog content, all of those specific different micro conversions are the user telling us as the brand and passing us the data in the tracking and tagging to say, oh, I've engaged with you. This, this has some value. And we'll go through the later in the presentation and show how we can use that. The important bit, and this is where I obviously have shoehorned back to the future into this, is that that journey isn't always the same. And we will see many different customers look very different at the end of their journey, but the, they started in a similar way. And this is what becomes more and more important to understand in the data when we start to talk about things like machine learning, where we're showing a model this kind of data and it sees commonality in the journeys that customers have. So what is often easy? Why is often hard? What's next is always harder. Now, what I mean by this is it's quite easy to explain what's going on there. That is a customer journey. Why that customer does those things in that particular order is actually quite hard. But actually, the thing that we want to do is go, what's about to happen? What do we what can we take from what has happened? And what and show what the future is going to hold. So the first thing that we're going to chat through from a forecasting perspective is once we know what's gone on, we know what those journeys look like, we know what sales happened, we know what channels drove them, we can start forecasting what's about to happen. And this is the thing that so many people are scared to do. It's quite scary to go to a senior person in the organization and say, this is how much revenue we're going to make next Tuesday. This is how much how many people are going to come to the, the website next weekend. But the, having a view that goes forward is significantly better than looking backwards. And the reason for that is if you start to look forward and start to put a line in the sand, then you can start to say, but if I do this action, that will impact that number by X amount. I, it moves to an action-based output instead of just looking at why things happened in the past and focusing so much on historical data. Now, one of the ways to do forecasting and, and probably the easiest way is run rate. So you just use the data that you have for the previous few weeks, days, months, whatever you have, look at how that's performing and then trend that forward over the next days, weeks, months. Now, uh, we've got an example here of something that uh, we've created, uh, and I've used a similar setup like this for years, where we have year-on-year -year performance with two different metrics. Now, as an aside, you should never have a graph that doesn't have a calculated metric and a, and a value-based metric. So a value-based metric is a count of something. So in here, you've got impressions. So this is the amount of people who saw a particular PPC ad. And then a calculated metric is something that's calculated, and that is the click-through rate. And having those two elements side by side is about adding context to the data. If we just had impressions and clicks, it's not easy for a person to see the relationship between those two metrics. And quite often, people will just put two value-based metrics or two calculated-based metrics together. And as much as that data is still correct, the ability to see the trend in the behavior over time is the important bit here. No one in 2021 should be doing week on week, day on day, month on month analysis. The goal for analytics and just being able to dashboard successfully is to look at trends in data over a much longer period of time to say, actually, how are things changing? And can we see where we could influence change in that behavior? So just to sort of pick out specific areas of this. Here are the impressions. So you've got the black bar and the pink bar. This is the impressions this year and last year. So we can see that we're significantly up year on year. Although recently, the last few uh, months here, uh, no weeks, um, are uh, decreasing in that, in that growth year on year. Then we've got the forecasted run rate for that period. So what the run rate has done is it's taken the growth rate year on year and applied that to the future weeks where we have last year's data for that period. And so that is giving us a forecasted impression volume that we think we're going to get based on the current trend in the behavior. 
Then we've got a similar approach for click-through rate. So we've got the click-through rates year on year, and then we've got the forecasted uh, data. And then we're focusing on the specifics in the middle. So we know that that's the current week that we've, well, it's the next week. So it's the week we're looking at. Now you can do this for a multitude of different things. So here we've got the volume of clicks and the conversion rate. So this is going, well, when we get more clicks to the website, what does that do to our conversion rate? Again, the relationship between those two different metrics. And here is where we've got, uh, year on year that doesn't make sense. So there was something that happened in 2020 on the 29th of June or the week commencing the 29th of June, but it actually happened that week last year and it has some weird data on click-through rate. Something happened that week. Now, wouldn't it be great if two weeks before that you were able to go and tell your boss, go and tell the MD, the data year on year is gonna look weird. We know this, we can tell that in advance. So we're all, obviously our click-through rate is going to be significantly higher than last year. That's not the game we're playing. We're playing the game of making more money. So we know that this is happening. We're not going to magically go, well, we did all our work this year. We must have done some great work. That's why the click-through rate is up. We know why that's going to happen. Now let's focus on what we can do to make an improvement on what we're currently doing. There's a ton of different things you can do here. So you can look at reach performance, click conversion performance, conversion effectiveness, cost efficiency, and conversion value efficiency. And that is just mixing things like media cost versus CPC, conversions versus revenue per sale. There's a ton of different ways you can cut this data. But again, in every circumstance, it is a value-based metric and a calculated-based metric. And this isn't just for PPC. You need to do things like this for general analytics when you talk about uh, the visits to a website and conversion rate or visits and bounce rate. There's a ton of different things, but make sure it's always value and calculated. So then let's get a little bit more advanced and start talking about time series forecasting. So this is where Facebook released uh, a platform for R, which is a programming language that's tailored more towards the data scientists and the mathematicians. Um, and they released it called Profit. And what this does is it uses the, the date-based data or time-based data uh, that you have to forecast using machine learning going forward. This is super simple to do so much that I did it in like a couple of hours, I installed R on my Mac. I then uh, put the data in that I had of visits, uh, I think it was visits per day, um, and it forecasts. Now, the problem with this is that if you either don't have much data historically, or you see a massive trend in, in, in the behavior, such as a global pandemic, and you're, the brand that you did the data on has had significant success through the pandemic, um, then the data is not going to necessarily trend out in that way. But you can actually create this kind of data um, in a multitude of different ways. But using profit, it has the ability to use machine learning to predict what the future may hold. So let's skip now to Back to the Future 2. So hopefully I've shoehorned Back to the Future 1 sufficiently. Let's start talking about Back to the Future 2. So I love this film. This is one of my favorite films. Um, so let's go a little bit more complicated. So what we're trying to understand as marketers is how does a user engage with us? What is the value of each engagement? And so we start thinking about user journeys and user maps and how that user can flow through that map through to the end of that journey. And quite often, the way to visualize this typically, and you can see this in Google Analytics and even in the new Google Analytics, is funnels. How does someone go through these particular order of these interactions in this particular journey? But that isn't how it works. How that typically works is exactly how this hamster is approaching this problem, is that they see that maze and they go the most efficient way in their opinion as they go through that journey through to the end. They don't necessarily follow the journey as we wanted them to. And that's exactly what customers do. Customers don't think I'm on a PPC visit. I've read this piece of content. They're just engaging with that brand. Is it giving me the information I want? Do I want to buy the product more or less based on the thing I've done? Now, 
as a marketer, we see that customer like this or a simplified version of this, if anything, where we just see the conversion happening. This is what goes on as that customer goes through that journey. Now, the first thing that we should understand is that each visit is not equal. So as much as the PPC visit started that user journey and the paid social happened in the middle and the affiliate happened at the end, we know that each of those visits aren't equal. So one of the things to start thinking about and make sure that you start to put data in place to understand is that, well, that visit isn't just a visit. It's a culmination of page views, micro conversions, macro conversions, and hundreds of other different data points, such as where is that person, what time of the day, um, what, what device are they using, what operating system, what browser. There's a ton of other data points that make up that visit and gives context of what value that visit has towards that, that user converting. So we would have things like the micro events that someone viewed a category for women's shoes, or they did a site search, or they visited a subcategory page as that person goes through. And there's obviously examples for all of them, but let's skip to this one. So we can see this person came through on organic search. It was the day after they saw a paid social ad. They viewed a product, they added it to basket, and then they went to the checkout stage one. But then that is the end of that visit. Well, the next visit starts on checkout stage one via an affiliate. So that, that affiliate drove someone into the basket, then they put a promo code in, then they checked out, and then they converted and bought. Now that happened the same day as organic search, yet the affiliate is going to get the credit for that conversion in typical last click analytics, where that is the last click or last visit that drove that final conversion. But we know that the organic search happened before that. That's the one where the person came in on a product-based landing page. And we also know that that person came via PPC um, uh, nearly a week before. So, well, it's exactly a week before. So why would we give all the credit to this final conversion when that person came in? But unfortunately, it's not even that complicated. It's even more complicated than that. So it, that visit could be x of y within a conversion journey so is it the first or second or third um the visits have multiple different page views so what content has that user engaged with throughout that journey um and it's not just the count of how many times that page has happened but each page would have a very different value within that co consumer journey some pages don't have much content on some have a a, a customization option some are blog content each one of those would have a different type of value and as i said previously what device did they visit on what where did that user come from what day of the week all of these things we want to understand the context behind that journey so we can start to say ah that's influential that's the thing that that user considered to be the most important we can't get that information from the customer. So we have to calculate that and, in, and try to get some understanding of the value of it, not just how many times it happened. So I've said micro conversion a few times, but here's some other examples. You've got things like viewing a product page, category pages, subscribing to newsletters, um, list segmentation. There are any, there's a so many that could be on this list. Obviously, there is one slide, and we just didn't want this to be a bullet pointed list of 400 different examples. The context here being is that most pages on a website, you want to give context at a level above the URL. So it's how do we categorize that type of event happening, whether it's a page existing and a person viewing that page, or they engage with that page itself. So let's start talking about machine learning. Now, I am no expert, although during lockdown, I've got a little bit smarter when it comes to machine learning. Um, my business partner loves this slide. He designed this deck and uh, I, I laugh when I first saw this. I am an idiot, so please excuse anyone who's watching who knows more than me about machine learning. I'm gonna try to explain this uh, in a reasonably basic way and I can't go any further. So. The first thing we need to define is what a, micro, a macro conversion is. And a macro conversion is the end of a consumer journey. And that's what we need to define. We need to define what success looks like. 
So what is success for this brand? Now in e-commerce, that's typically easy when it comes to an e-commerce conversion. One of the questions we got before the, the uh, webinar itself was what do I do if I run a lead gen company? There's a couple of things. I haven't got the slide in this deck, but something that we do for brands is that we have two different macro conversions. We have a lead being generated, and then we also get a macro conversion when that person becomes a, uh, a customer for that brand. So you have two different macro conversions, and the journey itself has two different macros that appear within that singular journey. I can go into more details later, but for now, we're gonna go back to e-commerce because it's the thing as consumers, we have the best understanding of. It's the end of something happening. So in this example, we've simplified those journeys down to touch points. So you have each of these is a separate visit. Um, the colors probably denotes the visits uh, for the, each channel. And there is a macro conversion that, that finished that particular journey. So we are looking at, loads of people who are successful here and so we want to show the machine learning well here is everyone that's possible that's successful and this is what success looks like so this is what i need the machine learning to go and look at and go yes this is what success looks like and then we show it everything so then we go here is everyone whether they've been successful or not and this is how they start their journey through to the potential of success so it's not that necessarily all of these people have not converted. We're just showing them all of the journeys where they've not had success yet. So anyone who even bounced and only has visited once is a potential converter on their second visit. Now, the interesting thing is when machine learning starts to see trends in that behavior and understand that trend in that behavior. So this last example here, you see two identical visit-based journeys and the last one has not converted yet. And then the final visit, we've seen that conversion. And it looks at the relationship between each of those. Now, about seven, eight years ago, I built something like this in Excel and it got to four gig that didn't open it took about 15 20 minutes to open and we just did channel definitions channel ordering and counts of channel it took ridiculous amount of processing power within excel i've upgraded that now we build everything in the cloud it's all built on database logic um, and we run machine learning models on top of databases in the cloud now what that is the enabler for is adding significant complexity into understanding that journey. So earlier when we were looking at the customer journey, we were talking about things like time, the time difference between each different interaction, all of the different types of micro conversions. And so what we do is we show the model all of this. We say, here is success. This is what success looks like. Here is everyone, including the people who were successful, now train and understand more about that customer journey for everyone for our brand that ends in or doesn't end in success. Now, the first thing you go is cool, that's nice, but is it any good? And how do we even define what accuracy looks like? Um, so machine learning models, and, and this is an example from the back end of, of Google Cloud Platform, gives you a score that says how accurate that model is. And that is an AUK score, which is the area under a curve. If it was a coin toss, you would see a diagonal line from the bottom left to the top right, which is basically it's a 50-50 chance of getting things correctly, is how I'm understanding this and how I'm telling people. I assume it's not 100% like that, but that is the, pr the principle. So here we're comparing converting users versus non-converting users. The thing that's more interesting to me is when we start applying this to people who have not converted. So this is about understanding whether that person will convert in the future. And so what we want the machine learning to tell us is we've shown you this customer, are they going to convert? So they haven't converted yet, they've visited the website, are they going to convert? And what it gives you is the output called a confusion matrix, where it says um, where the prediction has said that uh, they're going to convert. And we've now seen that person convert. So you have the training data. We are 78% in the top left quadrant there, likely to say that that person will convert and they actually did convert. 
And then on the bottom right quadrant, you've got people where we've said they're definitely not going to convert and they didn't convert. So that's 80% of the of uh, correction there. So this is how you can understand the value and, and accuracy of machine learning without going into all of the details behind the model. There's a few other things you can do. So you can say, actually, what uh, through a user's journey. So we've got a, a brand we work with where they've got a shop on their website, so an e-commerce shop, but you can also subscribe. So you can see the potential of that person converting and the value of a singular visit and the likelihood of that person purchasing based on the different types of conversion events you would have on a website. So is a person on an iOS device more or less likely to buy, uh, to buy from the shop or the subscription? So someone on iOS device is more likely to go to the shop other than subscription, whereas on a Windows device, they're more likely to do the subscription versus shop. Tons of stuff in there. I'm obviously oversimplifying this. Then we go into a singular journey. So what we've wanted to do here is go, well, each visit isn't now uh, in the context of a journey. So we now can go, which visit is the most important in that journey? Which one has driven that customer to most likely convert? It's not just the first, it's not just the last, but we apply this on an individual visit basis on an individual user's macro journey. So we can say, it, in this example, the third visit was the one that made them the most likely to convert. And, and you can do this for every single visit for every single user. It's not all about last visit. And this is why last click is not the best representation of the performance of your marketing, but it's better than not having data in the first place. All I'm gonna say on that one. So if we apply this to that user's journey that we, we were looking at previously, and if we focus on the table at the bottom now, you've got in a last click scenario, you're giving 100% of that credit to the visit five, so that affiliate conversion. So you've got one conversion, then you've got revenue of £76.50. You've got a media cost, so your, your uh, commission rate is £4.25. You've still got, you've got a return on investment of 1,800%. Fantastic. But you've got cost of your PPC, you've got cost of your paid social, and that's getting no credit. So once we overlay the machine learning onto this and it's saying, well, we're not going to give 100% of the credit for this, this journey to the last uh, element, we're going to distribute that back through that journey. It's not just the last click here. So it's giving what equates to 20% to the first visit, it's giving 15 to the second, five to the third, and 40% to the fourth. And that is because of the things that it has learned are driving success in, in successful journeys. So it knows that viewing a product page is really important. It knows that when that person has added something to basket, they're more likely to convert. Now in this example, that user didn't convert and therefore they then came back for an affiliate. So it's going, well, we're not gonna credit the affiliate with, with that value. We're gonna give that to organic search. This is actually real data for a single customer. Um, this isn't stuff I've made up, this is actual data. And then you can get to a return on investment and a revenue number for every single touch point there. So uh, what we're now gonna go through, um, is Back to Future 3, arguably the worst of the trilogy. I'm sure people will disagree with me, but um, yes, he's got a hoverboard, but he doesn't use it as much as he should. So what we're gonna talk about here is where you can use, and this is a terrible shoehorn, I'm, a ter I'm so sorry, old school mathematical methods with new media data. So there is a way to visualize data that is been used for decades, but we're going to apply digital data to show some interesting data sets here. So here is click through rate and understanding the value of click through rate. So these are called box plots. There's a, a really cool way of visualizing it that takes into consideration volume, which is called a violin plot, which uh, I know my business partner's listening and, and it's something we're going to put into our platform soon. Um, but the box plot shows a multitude of different things. So the first thing is um, it gives a, me a median 
value. So this is the middle value of your data set. It gives you your lower quartile. So effectively the 25% uh, of your data set and it gives you your upper quartile um, of that same data set. So it, the important bit here is that if you have outliers, so where if you had um, a, an average, which is the mean, which is the sum of everything divided by the count of everything, um, that gives you uh, a figure that is going to be skewed with an outlier. Whereas if you use uh, the median, that takes into consideration how often you have the same result happening within a data set. So click-through rate is a fantastic example of data that can be skewed massively. And this is a really good visual. So if you look at the, the bar that's third from the right, you can see that the, the bar distribution is quite far, uh, quite large. Then you've got the middle section, which is the, the darker green area, which is the difference between the lower quartile and the upper quartile. So you can see that that data set is, is quite large. Then you've got the median, which is the, uh, the gray dot in the middle. And what we are plotting is the historical data, which is the green and the gray area against the last week's data. So the red is the last week, and it shows how our click-through rate is performing in the last week compared to a baseline, which is, this is what we expect to see. So if that red dot is in the dark green area, we are within an expected percentage of the performance we see at the moment. In that example on the, on the third from the right, it's in the acceptable area, but it's in the lower end. So it's probably something we should be looking at. The furthest to the right is not doing great. So that's something you should definitely focus on. And there's a few here where the red area is significantly outside of that quartile range. And that's something you should look at. So this is just a way we can use old school, cough, cough, the Western tech to and apply uh, the, the modern world to it. It's just another really good way of, of visualizing uh, uh, complex data sets. So I've jumped around a bit, but I'm gonna bring it back to Back to the Future now. So this is stuff you should be already doing already. Get reporting where you have a, quanta, a, a calculated metric and a value-based metric on graphs. Do not do graphs that don't have those two. Um, make sure you also look at trend data, not just pre and post. Um, then we're going to skip forward and go, what should we be doing in the future? Start to understand customer journeys in a more complex way. Start to look at what machine learning can help you. It's not just a button that you can press and it answers all your questions. It's more about what do you need to understand about customers and what are they already telling you with their behavior that you're probably not looking at in the correct way. Stop using last click. And then the last bit is don't forget to look at old school statistical knowledge to understand the data that we have available. The amount of times that people go, oh, this is the best thing, it's the new stuff in marketing, and it's still the four Ps, it's still the old school stuff that has been around since the 50s and 60s that worked then, we can still apply that stuff now. And then the end credits from Back to the Future, because why not? Why not indeed, Russell? Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff to take in there. And I love the uh, links back to the films, although I did feel you perhaps you're getting a little bit flimsy towards the end. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> but once you've got the first two in, you have to do the third one. You've got to do the third one. Um, now, I think even for, for some of our team at Adida, you went to probably the nth degree of what is possible and obviously what you do is you know industry leading so i think from for nothing else today we've definitely learned what might be possible and how best to do it um so thank you very very much